Welcome back to the History Shelf, everybody out there in BookTube land. My name is Peg. I am your uh, fearless host, as ever. Uh, welcome back to another episode of New History on the Horizon. I have a batch of uh, newly released and about to be released books coming this spring with a mixture of fiction and a couple of historical fictions that I thought you might like to put on your radar uh, because they look really, really good and I thought you guys should know about them. Uh, programming note for long-standing uh, fans of the channel. I am alive. I'm surviving after the heartbreaking loss of my Detroit Lions. Been a fan forever. I've lived, grew up with the Lions and moved across the country, but the Lions are, have always been my team. Um, I have, I am a native and so I will always be a fan, no matter what happens. But the future is bright for our team. I think we're, we'll do really good things next year. And I think next year we'll clean up some of our mistakes and we will advance. Oh, yes. We will reach the Super Bowl. Trust and believe. Um, so, yeah, I'm dealing with that. But um, anyway, uh, Martine got me a nice... Uh, uh, you see this, this guy right over here where, well, yeah, she got me a, uh, <laughs> some type of trophy. I guess that's a Super Bowl trophy, right? But it's, it's for something else. I won the, um, the fantasy football league a few years ago at my company and I never really got, I never really won a prize. It was, I guess, just for bragging rights, but she's like, you should have won something. So she went and got me that. Isn't she just a sweetheart? Um, yeah, so I did. I won the fantasy football league. See, I know, I know football, baby. And I said, I said at the end of last year, didn't I, guys, somewhere on this channel, I said this year was going to be a good year for Detroit Lions, and it was. We broke all type of history records. We got our first playoff win in 30 years. We went to the NFC Championship. And four short points away from going to the Super Bowl. It was a brutal way to lose, let me just tell you. But... After the end of the upcoming Super Bowl, um, someone else is going to be feeling that way. <laughs> it won't be me. <laughs> uh, moving on. We are here to talk history. So let me show you a few books that have arrived at the History Shelf um, that I received from some publishers, some fantastic people. And one of them I uh, was really surprised to get, but the good folks at W.W. W. Norton, there goes a fuzzy, I've got orbs going on here. What is happening? Um, good folks at W.W. W. Norton sent me this book by esteemed uh, early American historian, colonial history. You'll recognize the name, Peter H. Wood. And this is the 50th anniversary edition of this book right here, Black Majority, Race, Rice and Rebellion in South Carolina, 1670 to 1740, um, with a foreword by Imani Perry and a new epilogue by the author. So I wasn't even aware of this book coming out, and uh, they sent me a copy in the mail. And I was just like, wow, thank you. So uh, let's take a look here. What, what about what this book? What are we doing here? Black Majority. And I will hold this up for you guys. I love the cover. Um, Black Majority chronicles the crucial formative years of South Carolina colonial South Carolina. North Americans, let me, let me, let me try this again. I got a little bit riled up talking about the lions. Okay, we're going to focus. Black Majority chronicles the crucial formative years of colonial South Carolina, North America's wealthiest and most tormented British colony. It explores how West African familiarity with rice determined the low country economy and how sickle cell trait helped protect against malaria. This skilled but enslaved labor force formed its own distinctive Gullah language and culture. I just have to say, I'm, I'm going to interject here. I just read and reviewed a massive new book that came out from um, Oxford University Press called Combi um, about um, the raid on Combi South Carolina and the author Etta Fields Black was talking very much about this. She must have used this as a main one of her one of her sources too. But she has done a lot of research into rice plantations, um, the Gullah uh, 
dialect and how it was formed. Um, so it was a fantastic book. It covered a lot of different categories. So anyway, it's called Combe, C-O-M-B-E-E. -E. Um, Harry, it's about Harry Tubman and the, um, on the raid uh, that happened in Combe, the Combe River in South Carolina. So I'll get back to this. Wa uh, Wood draws attention to the roots of African-American vernacular English, the scale of black migration, the involvement of blacks in the early frontier, and the struggles of enslaved people to emancipate themselves. Tracing the ways that conditions worsened for this black majority as the colony expanded, Wood documents how diverse acts of resistance increased. The most significant rebellion of the century occurred near the Stono River in 1739. Wood reveals how the quelling of this major uprising marked a tragic turning point for the enslavement of Africans in the American South. This revised and updated 50th anniversary edition also includes a new epilogue from the author describing the book's underpinnings and showing how its original themes remain as urgent as ever. Wow! It's just the time... They, when they sent me this, I was like, oh, I didn't request this, but... I wonder if they talk to each other, the different publishers, because I had just written a review of the new Combi book. Um, and it, there's a lot of similar themes here. But so this is going to be great. This will really round out uh, my reading on the topic. Fascinating. So this one is out right now. came out January 23rd uh, from W.W. W. Norton. All right. As always, I got to find a place to stack my books. I'm also going to move my keyboard out of the way so I can get the microphone closer so you can hear me better. All right. Next book we have here is from Amistad Press. And I've been hearing a lot about this one. This one came out, oh... Oh, yeah, just came out, actually. Just came out yesterday, guys. What perfect timing for this edition of New History on the Horizon. And I've got a finished copy. This is The Survivors of the Clotilda. Let me try to get the glare off of there. The Lost Stories of the Last Captives of the American Slave Trade by Hannah Durkin. There you go. Um, there we go. Let's see, Ra joining the ranks. Let me get there. Joining the ranks of Rebecca Sklutz, the immortal life of Henrietta Lacks and Zora Neale Hurston's rediscovered classic Barracoon, an immersive and revelatory history of the Clotilda, the last slave ship to land on U.S. soil, told through the stories of its survivors, the last documented survivors of any slave ship whose lives diverged and intersected in profound ways. The Clotilda docked in Mobile Bay, Alabama in July 1860, more than half a century after the passage of a federal law banning the importation of captive Africans, and nine months before the beginning of the Civil War. The last of its survivors lived well into the 20th century. They were the last witnesses to the final act of a terrible and significant period in world history. In this epic work, Dr. Hannah Durkin tells the stories of Cl Clotilda's 110 captives, drawing on her intense archival, historical, and sociological research. Um, the book follows their lives from their kidnappings in what is modern-day Nigeria through a terrifying 45-day journey across the Middle Passage from the subsequent sale of the move from the subsequent sale of the ship's 103 surviving children and young people into slavery across Alabama to the dawn of the civil rights movement in Selma, from the foundation of an all-black African town, later Africa Town in northern Mobile, an inspiration for writers of the Harlem Renaissance, including Zora Neale Hurston, to the foundation of the quilting community of G G Gies, Gies Bend, it's like G-E-E, -E, I guess Gies Bend, a black artistic circle whose cultural influence remains enormous. Um, it's a, an astonishing, deeply compelling t uh, tapestry of history, biography, and social commentary uh, that deepens our knowledge and understanding of the Black experience and of America and its tragic past. So that is The Survivors of the Clotilda. just came out yesterday. 
Um, photographs and, uh, you know, your typical uh, middle of the book illustrations in photos of the period. Wow. Artwork. So this is fantastic. So The Survivors of the Clotilda by Hannah Durkin. All right, so we've got two fantastic works on um, black history from that period, an unfortunate period, um, but very important. Let's see, another book. So we'll stay in the Civil War era. Uh, this is a slim little volume. Um, I should be able to knock this out really, really soon um, and quickly. This book, I've got... I've told Martine, as soon as we are able, I'm going to be buying a much bigger desk. I need, I need a U-shaped desk. I need, I need a desk on the side of me and a desk on this side of me. I have a lot going on here at the history shop. <laughs> Can't fit it on this desk anymore. Um, this is Sheridan's Secret Mission, how the, so how the South won the war after the Civil War by Robert Swicklick. I'm going to say Swicklick or Wicklick. But uh, yeah, this is by Harper, put out by Harper Books. Um, let me get this ready for you. Ooh, this is a long, this is a long pub sheet. My God, let me, oh my God, I've been really klutzy. I don't know what it is, guys. In late 1874, nearly 10 years after the Civil War ended, former slaves or freedmen found themselves threatened by violent militias such as the White League, who were determined to take away their newly won voting rights and consign them to a condition little better than slavery. President Ulysses S. Grant, vowing to enforce with rigor laws protecting the rights of former slaves, asked General Philip H. Sheridan to visit New Orleans and, and other Southern trouble spots to investigate the freedman's plight, all the while pretending to be on vacation. Sheridan's secret mission recounts the feisty Union war hero's southern sojourn amid tragic episodes of racial terror that ultimately fueled the overthrow of Reconstruction-era protections for black rights. Um, let's see here. Sheridan made a splash on his arrival in New Orleans on New Year's Eve accompanied by family and friends, and proclaiming they were sightseers bound for Cuba. But a few days later, through trickery and force, Democrats seized control of the nearby State House of Representatives, apparently assisted by White League operatives. Although the state's majority black electorate had arguably put Republicans, the party of Lincoln, and of freeing the slaves in control of the legislature. Federal soldiers stationed nearby ushered several Democrats out of the House chamber, and Sheridan publicly denounced the quote, spirit of defiance to all lawful authority, end quote, in Louisiana. He threatened to round up white league leaders to face trial before military uh, tribunals. In years past, northerners might have rallied to support the Union hero, but the public was weary of war issues. Many northern newspapers condemned Sheridan's actions and deplored the appearance of federal bayonets in a sovereign state legislature. Some called for Grant's impeachment. The controversial clash in the Louisiana legislature lies at the heart of this revelatory new narrative history. Uh, Shared and Secret Mission illuminates the bitter career of racial oppression in the, in the United States and resonates powerfully with our contemporary post-racial condition. All right, our author, uh, he was an editor at Wall Street Journal and uh, yeah, and he's written another book called House Rules. So it's a slim volume, as I said. It's out right now. It's about a little short of 200 pages. But that should be a really uh, fascinating read. Um, I, liked, I like Sheridan. He definitely was a plucky little dude. Um, again, this is from Harper. Harper Publishing. 
All right, so we got those three. What else do we have? Okay, now we're going to move into the new history still on the horizon. All right. Several of these I will be reviewing, so they're actually on my, my reading list, and actually a couple of them I've got to get going, like, today. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, you know, I'm not going to do this a matter of, of like, like, break them out per month. They're kind of mixed, and it would take too long for me to, right now, on camera, to um, sort them out. But let's see, we've got April, Marches, we've got... Yeah, we got a little bit of that. Let's do this one because it's coming out in February. It's actually coming out next week. And I'll be reviewing this for the Washington Independent Review of Books. And I'm, I'm currently reading it. But I was able to... I also got the finished copy, which is, which is critical when you're a reviewer. So... Oh, and I'm also reading... This is also a book that I'm reading for Historathon 2024. Hello! So yeah, I've got that underway right now. And this is The Killing Ground, a biography of Thermopylae by Mike Cole and Michael Livingston. And now the finished copy has a blur by Tom Holland. You can't beat that. Um, so I have shown this on the, um, the, the channel before and talked about it, but I'll just read this real briefly for you. Uh, Killing Ground is a captivating exploration of the legendary past of Thermopylae and the battles that have defined its history. From Leonidas and his 300 Spartans making their last stand against the Persian army to allied saboteurs during World War II, this blood-soaked ground has borne witness to countless clashes through the ages. The authors detail the powerful interplay between battles and the enduring terrain <clears throat> on which they fought, revealing why Thermopylae has been at the epicenter of warfare for over 2,000 years and what its past can tell us about our future. Um, so yeah, I'm glad to have this finished copy because... I was reading uh, the advanced review for my review and had no maps. So when they were going over the um, when they're going over the the layout, um, especially it's really interesting. They talk about the tectonic plates and how and how this section uh, uh, was formed and where the hot you know springs came from. Um, I didn't have any of these maps, particularly. There's a couple where they're really really detailed about the passes um anyway uh and then of course fantastic photos in the center kind of giving you a picture of the grounds the terrain Ugh, you know the artwork that i love mm -hmm. um so this comes out on february 6th next week and that's where you can pick that one up uh, any bookseller that you that you trust, that you love. Um, I think this book is... When is this book coming out? I don't... No, oh, I have a pub sheet. Okay. This book I'm also commissioned to write a review for, for Book Browse. Um, uh, my review is due the first week of March. And this one... But this one comes out February 13th. It's a slim little volume. Um, we're going to move over to World War II. And this is called Beverly Hill Spy. By uh, Subtitled, The Double Agent War, War Hero Who Helped Japan Attack Pearl Harbor by Ronald Drabkin. Um, this is out by William Morrow Books. Uh, it's a slim little uh, hardcover. A little over 220 pages photographs and such, but Beverly Hill Spy. So what do we have to say about this guy here? Obviously, I haven't started reading it yet, but I will. Uh, I have an interview with the author in this pup sheet, so that's nice. Um, here we go. Okay, Ronald Drabkin brings to, to light the untold story of R Frederick Rutland, a British war hero and real-life James Bond, who was involved in a Japanese spy ring in Hollywood in the lead-up to the attack on Pearl Harbor. Uh, in fact, the events of Pearl Harbor would almost certainly have been impossible without Rutland's participation, and yet his story has been virtually unknown until now. 
supported by recently declassified FBI files and by incorporating unique and rare research through MI5 and Japanese naval archives that few English speakers have access to, Drabkin pieces together to completion for the first time this stranger-than-fiction tale of one of the most unexplored uh, figures in espionage history. Interesting. Um, uh, the story of Rutland is a rags-to-riches coup for the ages. An uneducated boy from England's lower class, Rutland worked his way up the ranks of the British military, becoming one of the most accomplished aviators of World War I. Despite his impressive achievements, uh, including being the first pilot to take off and land a plane on a ship during battle and helping to design the first modern aircraft carrier, among other things, um, Rutland was not promoted in the new Royal Air Force in the wake of World War I due mostly to class politics. That's your mistake. Now you lost him. I bet you that pissed him off. <laughs> that's not in the uh, pub sheet, but that's what I'm saying. Um, this... <laughs> this ignominy led the disgruntled Rutland to become a spy for the Japanese Navy. Told you, told you. A career move that would have world-changing implications as he passed intelligence from Los Angeles to Tokyo that would lead to the bombing of Pearl Harbor. It says here, Drabkin, the author, is uniquely qualified to tell the story. His father and grandfather both worked in counterintelligence, and he is only a degree of separation from most of the characters featured in the book. Ah! This is going to be fun to uh, read and re write a review of, especially with that connection there. Fantastic. Beverly Hills Spy. Comes out February 13th from William Morrow Books. Check her out. If you're into World War II espionage stories and such. All right. I am going to try to go in a little bit of a... Uh, it's not as hard as I thought it would be. Um, we're going to go with April's, okay, then we have this one, which I don't have a pub sheet for, so, but I am reviewing it. I will be reviewing it for uh, Shelf Awareness, and now I've just moved my keyboard so I can't quickly try to, without you guys noticing, that I'm going to look uh, up the description so that... I have something to tell you about the book because it's kind of a one of those galleys that um, they kind of just glue together. But I'm going to read you something about it. Okay, now this book comes out March 26th. And it's coming out from Knopf, the good folks at Knopf. This is Takeover. Hitler's Final Rise to Power by Timothy W. Ryback. As you can see, again, it's just like one of those. It's a small little galley. Um, a little over 300 page book. Yet another new book on something about Hitler. Um, but we've got uh, Hindenburg on the cover there, um, um, shaking the new chancellor's hand. This is, okay, I'm sure this will be the final cover, but obviously there's nothing on the back. So, I am going to hold this up while I read to you this. In the summer of 1932, the Weimar Republic was on the verge of collapse. One in three Germans were unemployed. Violence was rampant. Hitler's National Socialists surged at the polls. Paul von Hindenburg, an aging war hero and avowed monarchist, was a reluctant president bound by oath to uphold the Constitution. The November elections offered Hitler the prospect of a Reichstag majority and the path to political power, but instead the Nazis lost two million votes. As membership hemorrhaged and financial backers withdrew, the Nazi party threatened to fracture. Hitler talked of suicide, if only. The New York Times declared he was finished, yet somehow in a few brief weeks he was Chancellor of Germany. In fascinating detail and with previously unaccessed archival materials, Timothy Ryback tells the remarkable story of Hitler's dismantling of democracy through democratic process. Uh, he, it's, uh, I'm sorry, it's just, again, I'm reading all of this history and it's just like repeats itself. He provides fresh perspective and insights into Hitler's personal and professional lives in these months. 
and all their complexity and uncertainty. Backroom deals, unlikely alliances, stunning betrayals, an ill-timed tax audit, and a fateful weekend that changed our world forever. Above all, Ryback details why a wearied Hindenburg, who disdained the Bohemian corporal, ultimately decided to appoint Hitler chancellor in January 1933. Within weeks, Germany was no longer a democracy. Who wants pie? All right, so, uh, <laughs> woo! I kind of held it off camera, didn't mean to. Sorry about that. Take over Hitler's Final Rise to Power uh, from Knopf Books. This comes out March 26, and I will be um, writing a review of this for Shelf Awareness, guys. So stay tuned. You can follow all of my written reviews. Uh, I write quite a bit. I cover quite a few books. You can follow them by uh, checking out in the description box below all the different social media channels. I post everything there um, for my written uh, my written work. So please follow along. Join me on the ride uh, of reviewing great history and historical fiction. And I do some other fiction. I do mysteries, thrillers. I do I I review indie authors too. So I do a wide range of book reviewing. Okay, now this book. You guys like big juicy historical fiction books? You're gonna you're gonna want to see this. Now I haven't read it, of course, because it's it's big and it's uh, it's a big book. Um, but it comes out March fifth. And we're going to go back. We're taking it back to Rome, baby. And this is I Am Rome by Santiago Postiguillo. Uh, a novel of Julius Caesar. I have the advanced uncorrected proofs here. Um, it's coming out from uh, Ballantine Books. I just said that, I think, yes. Uh, big book. Big book. We're looking at 560 odd pages or so. I am Rome. So what do we have to say here? Every legend has a beginning. Rome, 77 BC. The corrupt senator, Dolabella, is about to go on trial for his crimes. But Dolabella owns the jury. He's hired the best lawyers in the city, and he's very willing to use violence against those who oppose him. And all of Rome, no man dares accept the role of prosecutor. Until, against all odds, an unknown 23-year-old steps out to lead the case, defend the people of the city, and defy the power of the ruling elite. That lawyer's name is Gaius Julius Caesar. So begins Santiago Postguillo's acclaimed masterpiece of historical fiction, a tale as epic as Caesar's life itself, an irresistibly page-turning novel of politics and betrayal, grand battles and impossible odds, shocking villainy and even greater acts of courage. I Am Rome brilliantly animates the moments that shape this extraordinary young man's fate, and in so doing, changed the course of, hi course of history itself. Now, I should say, the translator, because this was written um, in Italian, and translator is Francis Riddle. Ah, oh, gosh, I take it back. This was not Italian, it was Spanish. <laughs> okay. Go figure. Uh, but Francis Riddle has translated numerous Spanish language authors, including including Isabella Lend, Claudia Pinheiro, Lila Guerrero, and Sarah Gallardo. Uh, fantastic. Okay, so originally written in Spanish, but we have I Am Rome, a novel of Julius Caesar, coming out March 5th. So like I said, I, I'm kind of mixing in some historical fiction as we go. All right, um, so we're going to go back to a March release. This is a, oh, it's a, it's a mixture of history, I think, and a little bit of, like, uh, political analysis or current events. I don't know, but this is from Live Right, um, and this is America Last. Got some politics in there. Uh, the Right's Century-Long Romance with Foreign Dictators. By Jacob Heilbrunn. Uh, this is coming out. Uh, this is March 2024. So I don't have the exact date on this yet. Mm, it's a little over 200 pages. So again, a, a slim volume. I can read this one pretty quickly. Uh, okay, I don't have a pub sheet, guys. I thought this one included a pub sheet. Here we go. 
Are you ready? I'm ready. A leading observer of the right explains the long disturbing history behind Donald Trump's admir admiration for Vladimir Putin and Ron DeSantis' veneration of Viktor Orban. Why is today's Republican Party, which claims to be the defender of American values, so drawn to the Russian dictator Vladimir Putin and the brazenly illiberal Viktor Orban, who has crushed an independent judiciary and political dissent in Hungary? As Jacob Heilbrunn shows, the obvious affection conservatives display for foreign autocrats, though a striking and seemingly inexplic inexplicable fact of our current moment, dates to the First World War. Since that time, leading intellectuals, journalists, and politicians on the right have always been drawn to what they perceive as the impressive strength of authoritarians abroad, including Kaiser Wilhelm, Francisco Franco, Adolf Hitler, and Augusto Pinochet, who offered models of how to fight back against liberalism and progressivism domestically. For decades, conservatives railed against communist fellow travelers in America, but have their own delusional history of, of, of apologetics. In this fast-paced, sorry, it's cracking me up. In this fast-paced, often droll account, Heilbrunn argues that dictator worship is a long-standing romantic impulse that fits firmly within the modern American political tradition. I might say, I might add, left and right. It's just not just conservatives, baby. Um, and shows what it means for us today. So this should be kind of fun to read, and I'll probably notate it a lot. Um, yeah, we did rail against communism, and there were a lot of uh, lefties who really liked Stalin, you know, and kind of toured, went over and toured uh the Soviet Union back in the day and wrote glowing reviews of it. So, you know, let's, you, you got to take it with a grain of salt because each side um, likes to uh, pathologize the other. So anyway, America lasts is what they're going to say here. The rights century long romance with foreign dictators by Jacob Halbrun. I'll be interested though, just for the history um, itself. And I will definitely make some notes on this. Um, yeah. We'll see. We'll see how this pans out. But this comes out in uh, March, March from Live Right. All right. What next? We've got some April books, and that is coming out in May. So we're going to save that one. That's coming out in May. That's coming out in May. Okay. Here we go. All right. A book that I am about to start reading today, tonight. Um, I need to have a review written by next, the middle of next week. So I got to get cranking because this book is, uh, it's over 400 pages, but I'm excited for you guys because we're going back to the civil war. We've got more biography here. This is, um, by an author. I think many of you recognize, and I recognize him too. He wrote Voyage of Mercy. He also wrote the, um, Dark Tide it was about the, the molasses flood. I think it was in Boston, I think. Um, and The Caning. I know Bill Rutenberg has read The Caning. So I, rec I recommended that book. This is the great abolitionist, Charles Sumner and the Fight for a More Perfect Union. Um, yeah, this is coming out April, 20 April 23rd. All right. Um, so yeah, I've got to get my review in early. But uh, I'm so excited for this. And it's uh, from St. Martin's Press, again, by Stephen, Stephen uh, uh, Puglio. Did I? Okay, I meant Puglio. Uh, I've got an advanced review. Hopefully I can get a finished copy of this. It'll have all the photographs and different, uh, different inserts. It says here, the groundbreaking biography of a forgotten civil rights hero. Let me take a step. In the tempestuous mid-19th century, as slavery consumed congressional debates and America careened toward civil war and split apart, when the very future of the nation hung in the balance, Charles Sumner's voice rang strongest, bravest, and most unwavering. Where others preached compromise and moderation, he denounced slavery's evils to all who would listen and demanded that it be wiped out of existence. More than any other person of his era, he blazed the trail on the country's long, uneven, and ongoing journey toward realizing its full promise to become a more perfect union. Before enduring the Civil War, a great personal sacrifice, Sumner was the conscience of the North and the most influential politician fighting for abolition. 
Throughout Reconstruction, no one championed the rights of emancipated people more than he did. Through the force of his words and his will, he moved America toward the twin goals of abolitionism and equal rights, which he fought for literally until the day he died. He laid the cornerstone arguments that civil rights advocates would build upon over the next century as the country strove to achieve equality among the races. The Great Abolitionist is the first major biography of Charles Sumner to be published in over 50 years. Acclaimed historian Stephen Puglio relates the story of one of the most influential non-presidents in American history with evocative and accessible prose transporting readers back to an era when our leaders exhibited true courage and authenticity in the face of unprecedented challenges. Yep, looking forward to, be, to beginning this one uh, tonight. Again, this will be coming out April 23rd, so just keep it on your radars. The Great Abolitionist, the first biography, major biography of this man in 50 years. That is something to be excited about. All right. I wanted to see, take a look at this book, too, because um, this this um, author wrote a book about the Hunley, the, the, the first, you know, submarine kind of used in the Civil War. Um, and now she has a new book. And this is called Chamber Divers. The untold story of the D-Day scientist who changed special operations forever by Rachel Lance. And she is the author of In the Waves. That was the one I was talking to you about just now. Um, let's see here. Rachel Lance, biomedical engineer, blast injury specialist. I'm trying to avoid that, Claire. Um, an author of In the Waves tells the unbelievable saga of the scientists, men and women, who made it possible for Allied troops to breathe and scout underwater, an advancement that would ultimately help win the war and change underwater exploration forever. The story has been buried in classified records for a generation, but Lance's tireless research finally brings the heroism of these scientists to light. Um, I'll read just a little bit more about it. Let's see here. Actually, I'm going to switch over to this one. I'm going to read to the ad, read in the back here. Um, on the beaches of Normandy, two summers before D-Day, the Allies attempted an all but forgotten landing. <clears throat> excuse me, of the nearly seven thousand Allied troops sent ashore, only a few hundred survived the terrible massacre, and the reason for the debacle was a lack of reconnaissance. The shore turned out to be impassable to tanks. The Nazis had hidden obstacles in unexpected places. The fortifications were more numerous and deadly than imagined. The Allies knew they needed to take the fight to Hitler on the European mainland to end the war, but they could not afford to be unprepared again. A small group of eccentric researchers experimenting on themselves from inside pressure tanks in the middle of the London air raids explored the deadly science needed to enable the critical reconnaissance vessels and underwater breathing apparatuses that would enable the Allies' dramatic history-making success during the next major beach landing, D-Day. Based on top-secret documents only recently declassified and hunted down by Rachel Lance, this is the story of a band of maverick, hard-drinking submarine researchers led by the controversial brilliant biologist and communist sympathizer J.B.S. Haldane, as well as the intrepid Dr. Helen Spurway. Without their lab and its wartime work, neither seals nor submarines could prowl the ocean the way they do today. That, I had never heard of this before. Oh, I love when it, oh, I love history that just uncovers something or at least shines a light on something that hasn't really been covered in any type of detail that I'm aware of. Um, wow. Underwater reconnaissance in the lead up to D-Day. And then even the Ark has some pictures in here and photographs, which is cool. So that's helpful. Um, I definitely would like to get the finished copy of this. Oh. It's the damage done to one of these oh, guys' lungs. Holy crap. Uh, so, does this not look great or what? All right. Chamber divers. Really stoked for this one, guys. 
Um, this one's coming out April 16th. So, ooh, keep an eye out for that. All right, you know what? We're at 40 minutes, guys. And I'm going to save the last two for another new history on the horizon as we get closer to May. But I have one more book that is historical fiction that is coming out in March, so I will include this one. Uh, I am going to try to squeeze this one into my uh, my review cycle. I'm going to try to read this and review it for shelf awareness, but I've, I've got to get started pretty soon. It's well over, it's almost 400 page book, but uh, it looks pretty interesting because I've always been intrigued by this, by this woman. Um, and this is Finding Margaret Fuller by Alison Pataki. Again, historical fiction. All right. It's coming out March 19th uh, from Valentine Books. I have to open it up to read you a little bit about it. All right. Massachusetts. 1836. Young, brazen, beautiful, and unapologetically brilliant, Margaret, Margaret Fuller accepts an invitation from Wal <laughs> Walf Ralph Waldo Emerson, the celebrated sage of Concord, to meet his coterie of enlightened friends shaping a nation in the throes of its own self-discovery. By the end of her stay, she will become the radiant genius and fiery heart of the Transcendentalists, a role model to young Louisa May Alcott, an inspiration to Nathaniel Hawthorne's character of Hester Prynne, and the scandalous Scarlet Letter, a friend to Henry David Thoreau as he ventures into the woods of Walden Pond, and a muse to Emerson himself. But Margaret craves more than poetry and interpersonal drama, and she finds her restless soul in need of new challenges and adventures. And so, she charts a singular course against a backdrop of dizzying historical drama. From Boston, where she hosts a woman-only literary salon for students like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, to the editorial meetings of The Dial magazine, where she hones her pen as its co-founder, to Harvard's library, where she is the first woman to study within its walls, to the gritty New York streets, where she spars with Edgar Allan Poe and reports on the writings of Frederick Douglass. Margaret defies conventions time and again as an activist for women and an advocate for humanity earning admirers and scathing critics alike. When the legendary Horace Greeley offers an assignment in Europe, Margaret again makes history as the first female foreign news correspondent, mingling with luminaries like Frederick Chopin, Walt Whitman, George Sand, and, and more. But it is in Rome where she finds a world of passion, romance, and revolution, taking a Roman count as a lover and sparking an international scandal. Evolving yet again into the roles of mother and countess, Margaret enters a new fight for Italy's unification. Aww. With a star-studded cast and epic sweep of historical events, this is the story of an inspiring trailblazer, a woman who loved big and lived even bigger, a fierce adventurer who transcended the rigid roles ascribed to women and changed history for millions all on her own terms. Obviously, many of us who are aware of Margaret Fuller know the ending. I'm not going to say more because if you're intrigued by this, I, I highly recommend you keep this, this book on your radar. Again, March 19th, Finding Margaret Fuller by Allison Pataki. I am going to try to fit this into my busy review schedule because it sounds like a really fun historical fiction read. All right, guys, so we're almost at 45 minutes. I hope you enjoyed this installment of New History on the Horizon. Uh, I've already got two in the kitty for next time as more books come online for May and onward I'll make another one but uh, let me know what you think in the comments below and uh, thanks for watching and subscribing and um, just being here with me on this journey I hope you're all doing well reading well and uh, staying well as I have I've got little uh, lint floaties floating around here I don't know I've got orbs going on in my life uh, anyway, guys, until next time, thanks for joining me on the History Shelf. I can't speak today. You know what? No, no I'm not going to sign off on that. I'm, I'm just going to stay a little longer to do this right. It's been a stressful week. But I am got some really great news today and 
praising God, feeling good, still a little klutzy, still stumbling over my tongue. But, um, but very grateful and thankful indeed to be here. So thanks for staying with me. Thanks for <laughs> putting up with my, my flubs and, uh, and my floaties. And until next time, BookTube, take care and be well and God's blessings to all of you. Bye-bye.